Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our very first guest lecture for the Upgrad Digital Marketing Certification Program. We are thrilled to have Professor Jaydeep Prabhu all the way from United Kingdom from Cambridge University with us here today for the session. So I really hope you enjoy it. Jaydeep will be giving us a quick lecture and also taking some questions from you guys, which you can submit on live chat. Over to you, Jaydeep. Thanks, Ishani. Good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join you from Cambridge. Um, before I begin, for those who don't know me, let me say a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in India. I studied engineering as an undergraduate at IIT Delhi. I then went to the US and I got a PhD at the University of Southern California. Um, I studied marketing um, and I taught at UCLA, uh, the Tilburg University in the Netherlands and here in the UK. Throughout my uh, career, I've studied innovation. Um, in the first part of my career, I studied innovation in large Western companies. Um, and then in about 2007 or so, um, I became interested in innovation in emerging markets like India. Um, and I want to draw on uh, my research experience for this lecture, uh, which is titled Frugal Innovation, How to Do More and Better with Less. I'll speak for about 20 minutes. Um, and then we'll take some questions and then I'll continue speaking for another 10 to 20 minutes and finish with a few more questions. So uh, when I started to look at innovation in countries like India, I was struck by how Indian innovators seem different from their Western counterparts in at least three ways. First, their approach to innovation was very frugal. They were very good at doing more with less. Uh, second, the mindset was very flexible. There was a lot of lateral thinking and improvisation. And finally, a lot of the solutions seemed designed to bring people who are outside the formal economy into the formal economy. Let me give you some examples. Uh, so by way of contrast, here is a product that you are likely to see uh, introduced by Western companies. Uh, it is a high-end fridge that will talk to you and can talk back to through this tablet PC. Uh, and for that price, uh, for, for that pleasure, you pay about $3,000. So it's quite an expensive proposition. And very often you see this with Western companies. They invest a lot in R&D. They often push the technology frontier for the sake of technology. They put that into their products to differentiate them and then they charge the customer for that. Now, in India and in other emerging economies, you may see things like that, but you're also likely to see a fridge like this. This is about $30. It's a clay fridge that uses the cooling properties of water stored in the matka at the top. You can, when the water uh, evaporates through the clay, not only does it keep the water cool, but it can also keep fruit and vegetables fresh for up to five days in a hot, dry climate. This is frugal. I'll tell you more about the innovator in a minute. You'll see his mindset is very flexible and that his intention was inclusive. It was to develop a fridge for people like himself uh, from villages and small towns that would not be able to afford a fridge. Uh, and even if they could afford a fridge, they might not have access to electricity. But here's another example. Um, this is an incubator from a company like GE. Um, it's a beautiful machine. It has all the bells and whistles but it's about $20,000. And at that price, it's really beyond the reach of many people, particularly in rural areas in emerging markets. Now, in a situation like that, something like this can be very powerful. The incubator from GE is $20,000. This baby warmer is only $20. Now, it's not an incubator. It doesn't have an oxygen tent, but it's designed to address a large part of the problem that incubators address namely the problem of infant mortality, where if infants are born prematurely, they cannot maintain their body temperature, and in many cases they will die unless they have something like this, which can protect them. Now, interestingly, this was not developed by a large company. It was developed by four students uh, who studied at Stanford uh, and took a course at Stanford called Design for Extreme Affordability, and the objective of the course was to come up with a working prototype that was 100 the cost of an existing problem solution. And they could choose any problem or solution. They chose incubators. 
Uh, after they graduated, they went on to commercialize this. They first tested it in Nepal and then in rural South India. Uh, they got venture capital backing from Stanford. They tested it in the medical hospital. And now GE, which makes these incubators, has a non-exclusive licensing agreement with Embrace to sell these uh, warmers, not only in various Indian states, but also in other countries around the world. So my co-authors and I studied a lot of these kinds of innovations in India and in other emerging markets. And in India, when we asked people how they would describe this kind of approach, this frugal, flexible, inclusive approach, they often use the word jugar to describe it. So my co-authors and I then ended up writing a book on the subject, which we call Jugaad Innovation, which we defined as the art of overcoming harsh constraints by improvising an effective solution using limited resources. So the emphasis is not on perfect solutions, but on good enough solutions that can use the resources that are widely available. And before we actually published this book, when we blogged about it, people from other parts of the world wrote to tell us that they had similar kinds of ideas in their economies. The Brazilians, for instance, said that they had two words to describe the same idea of Jugaad. And you see similar equivalents in other emerging economies, but you also see this in the West. And in the second half of my talk, I will talk about frugal innovation in the West. So what we did in the Jugaad book was we looked at lots of examples and we tried to identify some principles we thought would be guiding these innovators. So here are the six principles that we covered in the book. First, we found that these innovators are very good at doing more with less. They take advantage of resources that they have access to, which are relatively abundant, and they use those abundant resources as substitutes for resources that are scarce. Second, their solutions are very simple. And by keeping the solutions simple, not only can they economize on the resources needed, but they can also make the solution easy for people to adopt, maintain, and use. Third, the mindset is, as I was saying earlier, very flexible. There's a lot of lateral thinking. These people are the sort, if they face a mountain and they realize they cannot climb the mountain, they find a way around it. Fourth, they often get their inspiration from adverse circumstances, from resource constraints and adversity. Uh, I'll give you some examples in a minute. Fifth, they often include marginal groups, not only as customers, but also as part of the solution. And finally, these people are very passionate. They follow their instincts and their heart. They really believe in what they're doing. And this is very important because often what they're doing is quite difficult and they need to persevere over a long period of time. Let me introduce you to some of the people we talk about in the book. I will start with social entrepreneurs like Mansub Bhai. Uh, Hi. This is the first, yeah. Uh yeah, so sorry to interrupt. I think the image is uh, currently frozen for students. Uh, sort okay. of in your PowerPoint, all the slides are showing. So maybe can you click on the slide once um, that you're trying to talk about? So maybe okay. it should expand that. How is it now? Okay, it's not coming up for some reason. Uh, you try like selecting that slide. Normally that should work. So let me try going back to screen share. Let me screen sharing. Presenting to everyone. How is it now? Okay, it doesn't seem to be working. So, um, can you maybe close the PowerPoint? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll close it yeah. and yeah. Yeah, then and, that. and let me open it again. Okay, now let me open the slide. How is that? Um, yeah, uh, not opened yet. Um. Okay. Now? Should come, oh, uh, can you click on the first slide maybe? Maybe that will help. Uh, start. Okay, the 
Yeah, I think the slide is not, you know, popping up like it did before. Um, oh. Yeah, so what what's happening is all the slides are sort of showing for students. Oh, I see. Hmm. Yeah, like a menu format. Right, so. right, right. Okay, I... Okay, let me just... Hmm. Oh, what about if I try to do that? Yeah, now it's working, I think. At least we can see, yeah, we can see the first slide. So maybe you okay. can just click on each slide on the yeah. side. Okay. Let me try this, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There should go. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sorry for the interrupt. Okay. No problem. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, so I was talking about Mansur Bhai. Can you see this uh, slide now? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. So he's from a village in Gujarat. Uh, he has a high school education and uh, he comes from a family of potters. In uh, 2001, there was a very serious earthquake in Gujarat and a lot of people lost their household possessions, including the clay pots in which they store water, uh, the matkas. And one morning he said he opened the local newspaper and he saw a picture of someone's matka which was broken and the caption read, poor man's fridge broken. And that actually gave him the inspiration to make this fridge that you see. He set up a factory in his village, he trained local women and uh, then he went on to sell these on the internet. Now, he in a way embodies all these principles that I was talking about, you know, uh, doing more with less, using things that are widely available like clay and water, uh, keeping the solution simple. A um, lot of lateral thinking was involved, a lot of improvisation. He got his inspiration from this really adverse situation of the earthquake. He includes marginal people, not only as customers, but also, for instance, as employees, he trained local women so they can get another source of income. And finally, you can see him on his website, you can see he's very passionate about his products. Now, we wrote about many other types of innovators, such as Dr. Mohan, a different sort of social entrepreneur. He's a diabetes specialist from Chennai. Uh, diabetes, as you know, is a big problem in India. Uh, but people in cities can go to clinics like his, they can pay for the treatment and of course he has a very successful uh, private practice. But he knows that in the villages outside Chennai, uh, a lot of people don't know what diabetes is and they don't have an easy solution. They will not go to the city, uh, it's costly, it takes time. And his doctors from the city will typically not go to the village. So he's come up with this mobile clinic that you see here. He worked with the World Diabetes Foundation. They gave him this clinic. They gave him this van and also the equipment inside the van. And he worked with ISRO. They gave him the satellite dish, which you see on the top of the van. So this van goes from village to village. People like this lady from the village will step into the van. She looks through the eyepiece. That image is broadcast via satellite to the doctor. Uh, he can see this image on his computer screen and make an instant diagnosis, which he then communicates to this person here on the bottom, who's a local health volunteer. And that person is uh, one of a group of people that Dr. Mohan has selected from villages. They go to Chennai for some training, then they go back to their villages and act as volunteers. So you see these kinds of business models. Um, a third example. This is the example of Selco, a solar electric lighting company. This is the founder, Harish Hande, uh, based in Bangalore. Uh, he, through Selco, offers solar lighting solutions to people who otherwise don't have access to electricity and therefore use kerosene for lighting. Now, the big problem that he faced is that people cannot typically afford the cost of the panels and the batteries and the lights. Uh, most people he's trying to reach earn and spend on a daily basis. Um, and so they might typically spend something like 15 rupees a day on kerosene if they have that spare money. So he thought about how can I offer a solar lighting solution as a service to people who can spend 10 or 15 rupees a day. So here's a solution. He selects people like this person you see in the picture. Um, these people might again have a high school education. Typically they don't have bank accounts. So he trains them to use and maintain the panels and the batteries. Uh, Harish Hande works with a bank who will give them loans that Harish guarantees for the first six months. With the loan, this person will set up a shop like you see here. They will uh, buy the panels and the batteries like you see he's carrying. He'll charge the batteries during the day and the evening he'll rent them to people for say 15 rupees for the night. And so they don't, the end customer doesn't have to change their behavior. 
instead of paying for kerosene, they can rent this battery and they get a much better quality of life that lasts longer um, and they can uh, even be more productive at home. So the end consumer is better off, but so is this person uh, because after six months, he has a credit history. Harish can withdraw his, um, his uh, uh, guarantee and this person has a business as well. So we see such, lots of these kinds of entrepreneurs, but we also see large companies, uh, Indian companies getting into this kind of innovation. I'm sure all of you have heard of the Tata Nano from Tata Motors. That's a good example of large companies trying to do this kind of affordable innovation. Now, of course, we know that the Nano had some challenges, which goes to show that it's not just about developing technically good products that are affordable, you also have to think about the positioning and the marketing, and you have to think about the distribution as well. So there are many challenges when you're doing this kind of frugal innovation. But Tata has stuck with this. They went on to develop other frugal products like the Swatch water filter. Uh, again, this was about $10 using some nanotechnology uh, in the filter. Uh, you can see the design is very good. Again, a big challenge for them in terms of sales was from the marketing side, particularly the issue of distribution. Whereas you know, uh, there are retail, the retail channels are very uh, disaggregated in India, very fragmented. There are literally hundreds of thousands of Kirana stores that would stock these, and Tata's had to develop a relationship with each of them. So even though large companies can go in with all their resources and they can come up with technically good products that are affordable, they too face challenges uh, related to marketing. Multinationals are getting into frugal innovation in India and other emerging markets. For instance, GE has its largest R&D center outside the US in Bangalore, the Jack Welch Technology Center. They have been developing a whole range of medical devices specifically for Indian rural markets where what you need is you need devices like this ECG machine that doctors who go from the city to the village for uh, on a day trip can actually take with them in a handbag. So these devices need not only to be very affordable, they need to be portable, they need to be light, they need to run on batteries and so forth. So uh, GE has come up with these devices and in many cases they do jugards, if you can put it that way. So for instance, they realized that this machine needed um, a, a printer. So instead of creating it themselves, they looked around, they found that bus ticket printers could be used. They could use those components. They could even use that paper to make it cheaper. And for the, pad, the keypad, uh, they used uh, off the shelf, again, solutions from telephones. So they were able to develop this kind of device much faster, better and cheaper. And now this is selling in China and even in the West. Siemens has also developed many frugal uh, medical devices in their Bangalore R&D center, like this device that uses very cheap and easy to use microphone technology to check the status of the fetal heart instead of using very expensive ultrasound technology. And Siemens has gone on in their Bangalore R&D center to develop a whole range of products not only medical devices, but also for industrial goods. They call these products smart products, where smart stands for simple, maintenance-free, affordable, reliable, and timely to market. And these products are now being sold across the world. Of course, you all remember Nokia, and when Nokia dominated emerging markets like India, they did that because of uh, mobile phones like this 1100 series, which was specifically designed for people in developing countries in people living in urban slums. And now we've seen that these kinds of devices and increasingly even smartphones or feature phones are uh, ubiquitous in emerging markets. And they have transformed the landscape, not only in Asia, but also in Africa. So in Kenya, for instance, um, people like this lady who may be from a village, she can use that basic Nokia phone, not only to talk to her son who may have left the village to go and work in the city, but she can also ask him to text her money and he will use that basic Nokia phone to text her money, which she can accept uh, onto her phone and then cash it in a local Kirana shop. So this kind of money transfer has become a killer application in countries like Kenya. It's also now taking off in, uh, in India. And this 
once you have people who now who are previously not banked but now can easily make small payments you can also sell them other things for instance like solar lighting solutions like this one this was introduced in kenya it's called mkopa it's installed in somebody's hut in a village and because they cannot pay the upfront cost of the of the equipment they have to pay it off in installments and they can do this using mpesa um, this is an example of how mobile phones and missed calls are used for marketing in India. You may have heard of ZipDial. This is Valerie Wagoner, who is the founder and CEO of ZipDial in India. Uh, this is a marketing engagement and analytics platform. Essentially, clients like PNG and so on can contact ZipDial. ZipDial then creates a unique uh, number, phone number, uh, and they can advertise this in you know, bus stops and publicly on billboards. Customers can then call that number, give a missed call to that number. Their number is then registered on the zip dial database and they can get push notification uh, about promotions, etc., cetera, from uh, PNG. And they've shown that this is not only very cost effective, but it's also effective in terms of user engagement and traction. Um, a final example, of how mobile phones are transforming services. This is a service to farmers. Uh, farmers often have problems of not having timely information about the price of crops in neighboring markets. And so Reuters has come up with a solution called Market Light, which is essentially a text-based messaging service for farmers where for a monthly subscription, they get three text messages every morning to their mobile phone when they're in the field. One gives them local spot prices of select crops in select neighboring villages. Another gives them the weather for the day. And the third gives them some advice on crops. So there are lots of such frugal innovations in emerging markets like India, many opportunities for people like yourselves to develop new businesses, new solutions that are affordable, reaching large markets. Before I uh, continue with the second half of my lecture, which is about frugal innovation in the West, let me stop and take questions from you. Yeah. Hi, Jedi. We have a question submitted live from Rahul. So Rahul would like a bit of clarity on how do the big e-commerce players like Amazon, Flipkart, etc. do their segmentation and targeting? OK, great question. And in fact, those are masters of frugal innovation using digital technologies. And they have been set up from the start as very uh, savvy data-based data analytics uh, companies. So as you know, Amazon, for instance, is constantly collecting data on your behavior, your choices, but also on millions of other people like you. And they can use actual behavior, your decisions over time, compared to other people's decisions to identify groups of people based on their preferences and based on that data and analytics they can then send notifications to your account either email or your amazon account giving you recommendations of books you may not have heard about but from that data they can tell you would like another example is facebook facebook of course gets uh, lots of data um, from people uh, verbal data in terms of what people are saying but also their behavior, their likes, and so forth. I have a colleague here in Cambridge who is a big data expert. Uh, he's also a psychology uh, professor, so he has a background in psychology. In 2007, when Facebook allowed people to develop apps for Facebook, he developed a simple app which people could download onto their phones, and the app was to assess their personality. So it was a short survey where people could assess their personality and they would get feedback on that. Now he has developed a database of people's personality of about a million people. That's a huge data set. And he can correlate their personality with their likes. So he can go to various websites that they have on their accounts and look at what those people have liked, for instance, in terms of music. And he can then look for patterns between people's personality and their actual behavior uh, in terms of the likes. And based on that, he can now predict people's likes better than even people who know them. 
can predict. So uh, this is, I think, a huge uh, opportunity now for people who are starting businesses to set up their businesses around data and intelligence using digital to really understand individual customer behavior and then be able to aggregate it into segments. I'll talk some more about this when I talk about in the second half of my lecture on frugal innovation in the West. Um, do we have time for another quick question? Yeah, let's take another question. Yes, so we have a question live from Vaibhav Singh. He would like to know, um, he's talking about a specific online e-commerce uh, sort of bazaar, askmebazaar.com. He would like to know sort of what went wrong with it and resulted in their downfall. Um, are you familiar with the business? No, I don't. Ishani, can you tell me a bit about them? So I sort of looked it up. It's sort of an um, online shopping a place, not I think unlike a Amazon or a Flipkart, but yeah. uh, and they offer a wide variety of stores online and discounts, etc. So I guess we could generally discuss what are the general reasons for big online shopping platforms like this to fail as well, because yeah. I think new ones keep mushrooming up day in and yes. day out. Yes. So, yeah. so, you know, as I said, uh, online marketplaces, the critical, you know, the most important aspect, obviously, is how they manage the website and the, the web analytics, the collection of data and so on. But that's not the only thing. They also operate in the real world, in the physical world and being able to source uh, the uh, actual products that they sell on their marketplace, the procurement, the logistics. That is a major challenge and how they manage that is also very important. Then obviously also how they manage the relationship with the customer in the real world, the delivery of the products, the quality of that service, etc. So doing an online marketplace is not trivial. Um, obviously uh, you can go wrong in many places and it's possible that any one of these things went wrong. In the end, it's a question of management and management also of finances, who the investors were and so on. But from a marketing point of view, I would say the key things are managing the website, managing the procurement and the supply chain up to uh, the website, and then of course, managing the relationship with the customer and delivery. So, you know, any one of these things could have gone wrong with Ask Me. Um, we have a question that's been sort of submitted about uh, the topic that you're talking about currently, frugal innovation. So Samir Hanchate would like to know, hi Professor Prabhu, please share some insights, some of your insights and a few examples if possible on approaches to frugal innovation in the B2B services space. Okay, um, Samir, that's a great question. Maybe uh, let me continue with the second half and I think you may see some examples there. If I haven't presented enough examples of B2B, uh, please uh, remind me again uh, when we do the second round of questions, okay? Yeah, I think that sounds good. Uh, okay. Would, yeah, would you like to continue? Yeah, let me continue and then we can take more questions uh, when I'm done with the second half. Yeah, so, sounds so what I've talked about so far is frugal innovation in emerging economies like India. And, you know, that Jugard book I talked about came out in 2012. But after that book came out, my co-author and I realized there was a lot of interest in frugal innovation in the West for the West. So let me talk about that a bit. And I think that now is also having implications for countries like India. So particularly since the financial crisis, we've seen that in the West, customers are increasingly value conscious. And they're starting to look a lot like, you know, to some extent, like uh, customers in emerging markets. For instance, this survey by PwC finds that now something like 70 percent. So it was about 50 percent before. And now it's more than 17 percent more after the financial crisis. Something like 65 to 75 percent of people in the West are seeking discounts. They're buying private brands and they've accepted living with less. Um, but you also see Western consumers are values conscious. They're willing to pay extra for goods that come from companies that are socially responsible and especially younger people, so-called millennials, want to work for such companies. So we realize that in the West, you're seeing uh, what might be called the rise of prosumers. 
consumers who are no longer passive recipients of products and services from companies, but they're more actively involved in the economic process. And they're driving at least two movements, the sharing economy and the maker movement. So let's talk about sharing economy first. So the sharing economy sector is somewhat relatively small now, but it's expected to grow exponentially over the next few years. And why will it grow so fast? One of the reasons why it's going to grow fast is because it's essentially frugal. It's asset light. So if you take a, a you know, Airbnb, which is kind of the poster child for the sharing economy. The reason why they can grow so fast is over here, as Brian Chesky, the CEO says, Marriott, which is their main competitor, is a bricks and mortar uh, company. They have to physically build hotels. And, you know, even though they're very big, they might, you know, build something like 30,000 rooms in one year. But Airbnb can create that capacity in two weeks without having to spend any such capital or infrastructure. Uh, they can do that because they just basically have people who already have rooms uh, add that capacity online. Another example is Blah Blah Car. Uh, this is a car sharing service that started in Western Europe. You now have it in India as well. For instance, people want to travel from Delhi to Chandigarh. Somebody is uh, commuting in that car. They have extra space. They can sell those seats now on Blah Blah Car to other people who want to travel to Chandigarh that day. Uh, again, this is a very asset light, and you can see that how it quickly it has grown in Western Europe. Um, now, you know, it transports more people in Western Europe than Eurostar does. Eurostar is a major train service. So you see the sharing economy, and you see a lot of peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, uh, in, in, in not only in the West, it's obviously spreading to other parts of the world. But you also see what is called the maker movement. And this is where small teams of people, sometimes students, uh, are able to do what only large companies or the government could do, uh, say, 10 years ago. And one example is this organization called Design for America. These were four students from Northwestern University in Chicago who uh, two had an engineering background, one had a business background, one had a design background. When they graduated, they said, you know, if you want to solve big problems in the world, you don't have to go to Africa or Asia. You can, there are many problems in the US, such as this problem of hospital acquired infections that kill something like 100,000 people every year in the US. So they decided to come up with a solution. They went to a local hospital, they talked to doctors and nurses, they learned that these people obviously care about hygiene, but there are many times in the day when they cannot go to a wall unit to clean their hands. So these uh, four students, they went back to their studio, which is probably a room the size of my office, maybe a little bigger, where they have computers, they have software, they have a 3D printer. They brainstormed and they said, what if we could take the wall dispenser and have it clip on to the doctor's uniform or the nurse's uniform? Uh, so they developed a prototype, and you see that in the bottom right, it's, uh, uh, it's called Swipe Sense. Basically, you run your hand over it, and it releases a gel, which you can use to clean your hands. Um, and then there's also a data component, because every time you do that, you see that little blue light, it sends a signal to a wall unit that stores the data, and the doctors and nurses can upload that data at the end of the day to see how they have performed relative to others in the hospital. Now, the whole thing, uh, from getting the idea to developing the prototype to manufacturing and selling this was done by these students using things that are available to many people around the world. So they got the idea by just talking to doctors and nurses, observing and brainstorming. They then developed the prototype in their studio using computers and a 3D printer. When they had to commercialize it, they couldn't manufacture this themselves, so they outsourced the manufacturing. They needed funding, so they did crowdfunding. Uh, when, when they had to distribute it, they couldn't distribute it themselves. They didn't have a sales force, so they used Amazon. And finally, when they had to advertise it, they didn't have an advertising budget, so they used social media, and they did a TED Talk, which went viral. So the whole process was done by a group of four students. This is another example. This is a former student of mine here in Cambridge. His name is Evan Upton. And uh, he was also responsible for student admissions in computer science here in Cambridge. 
and he and his colleagues realized that fewer people were applying to study computer science in Cambridge, and the ones who did apply didn't had never opened the inside of a computer or never done any coding. So they said, what if we can develop a basic computer that is so cheap, you can give one to every school kid in the UK, and it doesn't matter if they break it. And it's also so basic that they would have to play with the hardware and also code. And so they came up with the Raspberry Pi. You see that in his hand. That's the computer. When it came out, it was about $30. They've now introduced a $5 version. And basically, these cheap computers now help people to also develop other devices, combining them with services, it seems like sensors and so on, to develop frugal devices. Uh, another student of mine, uh, who's Indian, Prabhu Subramaniam, he took the Raspberry Pi, he gave it a cladding, he branded it co-learner, and he loaded it with the Khan Academy, which is the entire US school curriculum available in video form on YouTube for anyone to access. Now, Prabhu knows that there are many people around the world who don't have access to the internet, and maybe they don't have access to PCs, but often they have televisions. So this simple device can connect to a television so they can use the TV as a display. And then kids who don't have access to the internet can also uh, learn, uh, you know, for instance, from the US school curriculum. So you see these kinds of possibilities now open to young people around the world. We carry around very sophisticated computers in our pockets, these smartphones. This is a company that came out of uh, University of California at Berkeley called Cellscope. They have developed medical devices that essentially tap in the, connects to the audio jack of a smartphone, and it can be used here uh, to, to, for instance, this is an otoscope. So a mother can take very high resolution pictures of the inner ear of her daughter if she has an infection, and send them, text them essentially to an expert who is somewhere else. So this device is a fraction of the cost of the standalone uh, medical device and also it helps create more autonomy from the patients and telemedicine um, In the US and even in Europe many people are actually outside the banking system often these are immigrants These are people who are in uh, the cash economy. They don't have credit cards and debit cards But they want to buy on the internet. So how can you make purchases on the internet and still pay in cash? without a debit or credit card. This company, Pay Near Me, has a solution. So essentially, if you want to buy something on the internet, you go on the website, let's say you want to buy a bus ticket, Greyhound bus ticket, you, you buy your bus ticket, and then when you're checking out, you say pay in cash, you choose that option, and it will then send you a text message to your smartphone. You then go to the corner shop, the uh, uh, Kirana shop in the US, which is the 7-Eleven, and you pay in cash, they scan the barcode and give you your ticket. So there are ways in which smartphones can be used uh, for banking and payments. 3D printers. Uh, this 3D printer, for instance, I'm showing you here is about $179. At that price, it's increasingly affordable to even households. Um, here's an example of a young person from Harvard Business School, Grace Choi. Uh, she has de designed this 3D printer you see here called the Mink. What it does is it takes the color palette from your PC. You can then choose the exact shade of makeup that you want, and you can print it out on this 3D printer to make. So you see now the use of 3D printers to do all kinds of things. Now, even if you cannot afford a 3D printer, you can go to spaces. These are called make spaces or fab labs or tech shops. These are like workshops where you get access to all these tools like laser cutters, 3D printers, and so on. And you can make things. And you can also get access to people like yourself who are makers, who are you know, good with these kinds of technologies and good with prototyping. So for instance, I told you about those students from Stanford who came up with this baby warmer. When they were taking the course at Stanford, they actually had to come up with a working prototype of the baby warmer. So they went to a tech shop near Stanford in Palo Alto, and they were trying to make this warmer. Uh, they thought it would be like a blanket that the mother could carry and hold the baby in. 
but a blanket is not enough. You need something that would keep temperature fixed for a period of time. And they didn't know how to do it. They were talking to someone there who turned out to be a NASA scientist. And he told them about phase change materials, this waxy substance that you can put in a pad and you can heat it either through, you, through electricity or hot water and it will keep temperature fixed for a period of time. So that's how they got the idea. Uh, of course, they've become quite famous. This is uh, Jane Chen of Embrace with Obama. And in fact, Obama himself recognizes the value of this kind of, these kinds of devices, 3D printers and these spaces and the maker movement. In fact, he hosted a maker fair in the White House in 2014 to showcase that this is a new type of manufacturing, more value added local manufacturing that can revitalize manufacturing in the US. And I think this also offers huge opportunities in India, in the era of make in India, et cetera, to develop maybe a new kind of 21st century manufacturing in uh, various parts of India. So the maker movement is very big. They have maker fairs in many uh, Western cities. Now they also have maker fairs in India. I've seen them in various cities like Bangalore. Um, in 2014, I went to Rome for the Maker Fair here in Europe, um, and I saw lots of uh, ordinary people, young people, sometimes kids with their families, uh, actually demonstrating things that they have done. So one of the demonstrations was a group of students from the European Institute of Design in Milan, and they were showing smart lighting solutions that they have developed. One of those uh, solutions basically had two sensors in a flowering pot with a plant in it. And those two sensors were connected to a red and a green light through an Arduino computer, which is like a Raspberry Pi. It's a small microcontroller. And the idea was that when the soil is dry, the sensor send a signal and the green light goes off. So you know you have to water the plant. And when the soil is wet, the red light it stays on so you don't water the plant. Now, I thought this was an interesting application. And shortly after that, I heard about a commercial use of such, a, such an idea. This stick that you see here is called a G-Thrive. Uh, basically, it's a stick that farmers can put in the ground in different parts of their uh, land. Uh, it has sensors underneath the soil which will read data on uh, humidity, nutrition, etc. Above the soil, it will read things like temperature and sunlight, and it will send that data wirelessly to a PC or to an app on a smartphone where the farmer can visualize um, their field. And then they can get feedback and advice on where they should water and where they should put fertilizer. So this can be a very powerful way to do uh, agriculture. In Barcelona, the mayor has championed uh, a network of fab labs. These are maker spaces like the one I showed you, the tech shop one. And they decided to tackle this problem of city pollution. So this is a problem in cities around the world, not only in India, but even in the West. Often the city will uh, talk to a big company like maybe Cisco or IBM. They'll get some very expensive equipment that costs maybe 20,000, 30,000 euros. They'll buy many of those units, maybe 10 or 20 and put them in different parts of the city to read uh, these indicators. And uh, that's how it works. So what they said was that there's a much better uh, and more intelligent way of doing it. We should come up with very cheap sensors, kits, that citizens can buy and install in their homes. So they developed a kit from the Fab Lab, which they sell out of the Fab Lab. One part of the kit is a sensor that you put outside your window and it reads all these uh, things, air quality, temperature, et cetera. The other part uh, will receive the data, you plug it into your computer, it sends the data through the internet. And then this data is collected from many people and fed back. So you get processed information. You know why your part of Barcelona was more polluted or when it was more polluted. And then you can talk to your local council and make a change. So you see these kinds of Internet of Things solutions now. And a lot of these are coming from entrepreneurs. But large companies are now asking, what can we do? How can we tap into this frugal innovation revolution? So my co-author and I wrote a follow-up book uh, called Frugal Innovation, which was about frugal innovation in the West. 
Um, and in that book, we thought of frugal innovation as a ratio of the value that you're generating from the solution to the resources that you are putting in. And you want to increase the value while reduce the resources. The value could be to customers, to shareholders, or to society. The resources could be financial resources, natural resources, or time. Again, in this book, we looked at lots of examples and we tried to extract some principles. Uh, I won't go into all these principles. I'll just talk about a couple. I'll give you some examples of principles five and six, which is working with prosumers and other innovators. So for the motor company in Detroit, they formed a partnership with TechShop uh, so that the Ford employees could go uh, once a week and tinker, just play with other people uh, in the community. And you see them over here, they're trying out different things. Well, Ford realized that this improved the motivation of their employees, but it also improved their productivity. Through this, they were generating more high value uh, patents one year after they started this program. Uh, Here is an example. Maybe this uh, this is an example of B two B innovation or partnerships. Uh, this lady here is the chief marketing officer of GE, and the guy she's talking to is a twenty something CEO and founder of a startup in New York called Quirky. So GE, which is a hundred years old and is one of the largest companies in the world, went to Quirky recently and said, "Can you help us?" Uh, innovate our air conditioning line, our air conditioning products. Now, who's Quirky? Why are they going to Quirky? Well, Quirky is a startup that crowdsources innovations. So it's an online platform where people like you and me can go and we can suggest ideas for new uh, home appliances. It could be in the kitchen or it could be things like uh, air conditioning and so on. And other people in the community vote on these ideas. Quirky then selects a few of the most popular ideas to, uh, to prototype, to test, and then eventually commercialize. So GE asks Quirky, can you help us? And it so happened that Quirky had somebody on that platform, this person, Garth and Leslie, who had suggested this smart air conditioner, which you could control remotely using your smartphone. So now the solution is jointly marketed by Quirky and GE. So you see these kinds of partnerships of frugal innovation, to some extent you could call it B2B. Uh, now, companies like Barclays, which is a very big bank here in the UK, they realize that just like Amazon has this relationship with its customers and uses their data to segment and target them, they can as a bank also do the same thing. They have lots of very detailed data on our purchases. They know not only what individuals do, they can compare that to other people, millions of other customers. So they could be providing very good advice to us online or through our smartphones on how we can use our finances better. Now, they have the resources to develop these apps. Uh, they have the money, they have the people, but their organizational structure is very rigid. There are, it's very hierarchical, there are silos, and they find it hard to do this kind of agile, frugal innovation. So they say, well, we are surrounded in London by all these startups, these so-called FinTech or financial tech startups. Maybe we can tap into their entrepreneurial ideas. So they have created an accelerator in London where every three months they have 10 FinTech startups that are housed there and are mentored by people from the main bank. So the startups, get a lot of advice from the bank. They, under, they learn from the bank about regulations, about customers, and so on. But the mentors from the bank also learn a lot from the entrepreneurs. And at the end of the three months, 13 weeks, the startups pitch to a team from Barclays, and then Barclays makes a decision of whether to uh, buy this and integrate it into the bank or to invest it. So let me conclude now by just saying that um, some of the challenges, particularly for large organizations, that frugal innovation poses. Well, first, that big organizations often think about expensive, long-term projects, uh, which are technology-driven. And they need to learn to do more with less and be more driven by customer needs. 
Um, many times they're very structured and so they cannot be agile. They take a long time to innovate. They need to learn to be, to innovate faster. And often their approach is very controlled. They often have only an R&D team that does innovation. But now they need to learn to include other people in the organization, including people who are close to the customer, like sales, but also people from outside the organization. Three ways that they could do this. One is they could engage with prosumers in the way that Ford is engaging with them through tech shops, the partnership with tech shop. Or they could engage with agile entrepreneurs like Barclays is doing with fintech startups. Or they could create, if they're Western, they could get this kind of Jugaad mindset by going to emerging markets like GE has done or Siemens has done. Now the challenge for small organizations is almost the reverse because startups often are very agile. Um, they have to be. Um, they are also very frugal because they don't have resources so they have to think cleverly. But the problem that they face often is that often they don't have the resources needed to scale. Uh, and that's where they can benefit from forming relationships with large companies that have the resources to scale. But then they need to learn to partner with large organizations. And that's the example of the Embrace Baby Warmer that I gave. They have partnered with GE and GE is helping them to sell that product. So let me just conclude by saying that based on my work over the last few years, I strongly believe that the world needs this kind of frugal, flexible, and inclusive innovation. I think Indian firms uh, can gain uh, by engaging with their developed market counterparts. They can both learn from each other how to do this. And I think that large and small firms can work together to improve lives everywhere. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the sharing your insights, Jerry. So we have some uh, quite a few questions that have come in live for you during yeah. the lecture. So uh, one of the questions is from Ajinkya. So Ajinkya would like a few inputs from you. If a company is a new entrant into the e-commerce space, what are the steps that the company should take in order to start with a marketing process that include the general 4Ps, STP, etc.? Okay. Great question. So, you know, the way to do that, and this is one of the principles that I didn't uh, elaborate on, but which you see very much uh, in, 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 uh, in startups, is the first principle of engage and iterate. So you can see this principle, not only in our book, but lots of other books written about the entrepreneurial process, like Lean Startup, or if you have read Peter Thiel's Zero to One, they all talk about this uh, idea of starting with a core customer for your solution, your e-commerce solution. And actually, this is not just for e-commerce, for any kind of product or service that you have. Start with a core customer, develop a minimum viable product. So it's not a perfect product. It's a basic solution that's trying to solve the main part of the problem for that core customer. And then you work closely, you engage with the customer, you get feedback from the customer on how they're using your minimum viable product, which aspects they really like, which things are nice to have but not necessary. You get that feedback, you iterate on improving your solution accordingly, and you keep doing this in many quick cycles. This is a very effective way to not only identify what and who your core customer is. So that's like the targeting, the segmentation and targeting bit. But also to figure out what should your ideal positioning be. So that's the four Ps. What should the core product uh, features be? What should the design be? What should the brand be even? How should you price it? Um, what kind of price plan should you have? What kind of promotional strap line should it have? How should you distribute it? What should the channel look like? So that would be my advice, is to uh, think hard about this principle of engage and iterate. Uh, you will see a lot of detail uh, around this process in books like Lean Startup uh, and Zero to One. Thanks, uh, Jadeep. So we have another question from Ankur. 
Um, Ankur would like to know, so in a case like VW Dieselgate, where a company tampered with a polluting unit and showed a lower pollution, and that obviously took a toll on the company's reputation, how would they gain their consumers' trust back? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, and that, that uh, you know, that's probably a multi-pronged answer would be needed for that. But the first thing to do, and this is a fundamental lesson of marketing, is that the perception of your brand in the minds of consumers is what the brand is. Brands are about the associations that your customers have with your products and services. And you want those associations to be strong, positive, and unique. So the moment that association is or those three things, the strength, the uniqueness, and the positiveness are threatened, you need to uh, remedy the situation. So in the case with VW, the association, which was hopefully positive, now suddenly becomes negative, right? So they expect a certain level of uh, you know, environmental responsibility from you, and they find that you cheated, that trust, that positive image is immediately uh, you know, damaged. So what can they do to rectify it? First, they have to rectify the reality. Now, they would have to, for instance, recall. It may be very expensive to do, but they have to do these things. They would have to recall the tampered uh, cars. This took a lot of time just because, you know, recalling cars is not easy. For instance, some of you may have heard of Zipcar. Zipcar is a car club, a car rental loan club that you have in many countries, including here in Cambridge. I'm a member of Zipcar. All those cars used to be VW cars. And over a period of months, they had to replace them with VW's help with other cars like Ford. So that's the first thing. You have to address the, the reality. If there are bad cars out there with poor pollution control, you have to withdraw them from the market. Then you have to actually ensure that the cars you're putting out, the new cars, meet the pollution standards and maybe even exceed the pollution standards. So you have to change the physical reality. But then you also have to address the perception. The perception is the physical reality plus the awareness and things like that. So now you have to communicate to people, your customers, and you have to do this in a way that's convincing that you have made these physical changes, that you have improved the products, they meet emission standards, control standards, and you've withdrawn all bad cards. So that is a long, tricky, difficult, expensive process, but the principles are simple. They go back to your reputation is the perception of your brand by your customers, and that perception has to be strong, positive, and unique. Now, in answering that question, I realized that the previous question about how should an internet startup segment, another thing I should mention, which I mentioned in the first half, was when you're engaging an iterate, is to have data and be data driven. So have uh, systems in place that will start collecting data on your customers and their feedback. And this is where digital is very helpful because you can engage with customers through a digital medium like an app and you can collect data on them without it being expensive or very obtrusive. People's behavior is the data that's recorded on the website. Um, now that is difficult to do in the real world if you're a car company and so on. But increasingly, smart car companies are also developing data on their customers and also data on their vehicles. And I think data and good use collection and use of data and analytics can help you build your brand and could potentially help VW as well, especially if they're doing direct marketing with their customers. So they can uh, keep uh, customers aware of how they are responding to these crises in an online, real-time way. So thanks for that, Jadid. In continuation to what you were just talking about, in continuation to the importance that data holds, Pankaj has a question. So he would like to know, how would you compare the maturity and usage of data analytics across India, UK, and US markets? And if the results are obvious that data is indeed helpful, what is the barrier for mass usage? Okay, great question. So, you know, I think that the differences are not country. Uh, so it's not like, 
you know, obviously an average, maybe the West is ahead of emerging markets. But I think the more interesting thing is to compare organizations, different types of companies within these countries. So, you know, in India, you will have companies that are very savvy in how they collect uh, and use data. And equally, uh, you will have some companies that are not. And the same is true in the UK and US. In the UK and US, you can have some companies that are very data savvy and you can have some companies that are not. So it's really, I think, these 21st century uh, startups and giants, some of them are giants now, that formed, they've started around data. So if you think of the big companies over the last few years that started in the late 20th century, if you think of Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, you know, and now if you think about uh, uh, Airbnb, Uber, companies like that, they started by having a digital solution or at least a digital manifestational solution. And they started by collecting data. If you take Airbnb or you take uh, <coughs> Uber, they have data on the customer side through the app. So they're tracking data on people who are uh, using taxis and ordering taxis, but they also have data on the supply side of people who are offering their services as taxi drivers. So I think that's the kind of sophisticated 21st century frugal company that you want to develop. You want to develop a company that's essentially digital and that has a kind of platform that can use people's behavior as a source of data which you then can analyze uh, in very sophisticated ways to get insight into the customer preferences, the segments out there, and then even give recommendations and manage uh, the marketplace. So I would say that those kinds of companies, whether they are in the UK or in India or in the US, are the companies that will lead in the 21st century. They're already leading and they will lead in the future because they're essentially smart, they're essentially frugal, yeah, thanks a lot uh, for your time, Jedi. So guys, I think that brings us to an end to today's session. So uh, thanks a lot, Jedi, for sharing your insights on frugal innovation and taking questions from our students. I think we have a few more questions that we weren't able to take due to time constraints, but guys, we'll definitely try and get back to you with some responses from our side. Thanks a lot, Jaydeep, and thanks, guys, for joining us. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.